Well, thank you all so much for joining us for tonight's program. Before we get started, I wanted to thank the 30 or so libraries who are partnering with the Tewksbury Library tonight. Uh, and they are Andover, Bill Ricca, Brewster, Canton, Carlisle, Dennis, Drakett, East Longmeadow, uh, Fitchburg, Gardner, Groton, Hamilton, Wenham, Harvard, Lowell, Linfield, Mansfield, Milford, Nahant, Northborough, Norden, Salisbury, Situate, Shutesbury, South Hadley, Stoneham, Swansea, Tewksbury, Waltham, and Whitman. So I sincerely apologize if I missed any, but I think I got them all. So very excited. Thank you all so much for joining us here tonight. And uh, we're here tonight to hear from one of Massachusetts must-read authors, uh, Nicholas Basbanes. Uh, Nicholas was recently recognized by the Massachusetts Center for the Book as one of Massachusetts must-read authors of the year. Uh, he uh, will, is joining us here tonight for a presentation on his critically acclaimed book, Cross of Snow, A Life of Henry Wadsworth Longfellow. And I'm actually shortchanging Nicholas. Not only was he recognized, uh, but he was actually one of the finalists. He was one of the three finalists for a uh, best nonfiction book written by a Massachusetts author last year. So congratulations, Nicholas. A little bit about the book, uh, In Cross of Snow, the result of more than 12 years of research, including access to never before examined letters, <laughs> diaries, journals, and notes, Nicholas reveals the life, the times, the work, and the soul of Henry Wadsworth Longfellow, the man who shaped the literature of a new nation with his countless poems, sonnets, stories, essays, translations, and whose renown was so wide-reaching that his deep friendships included Charles Dickens, Nathaniel Hawthorne, Ralph Waldo Emerson, Julia Ward Howe, and Oscar Wilde. So Nicholas, who's a Lowell native, is an award-winning investigative journalist, and was literary editor of the Worcester Sunday Telegram. His articles have appeared in the New York Times, the Washington Post, uh, the Smithsonian, and uh, many other publications. And he is the author of eight books. Uh, Nicholas lives uh, here in Massachusetts in North Grafton. And uh, again, wanna thank the 30 libraries for uh, partnering for tonight's program. So uh, everyone who's live on the call, let's give a big virtual round of applause to Nicholas for joining us here tonight. And Nicholas, you can take it away. Thanks so okay. much. Okay, well, Robert, thank you for that fabulous introduction. 30 libraries, that's, uh, it's uh, humbling. Thank you, and thank you to all the other people. Did you say Colorado, uh, San Antonio, Texas, Florida? Thank you, thank you for joining us, and thanks to the Massachusetts Center for the Book for uh, recognizing Cross of Snow. Uh, this is a Massachusetts story, as it happens. It's also a New England story. It's an American story. And as you'll see as we get into it, it's an international story. Uh, Henry Wadsworth Longfellow was beloved, not only here, but all over the world. And so I'm going to launch right into my, my PowerPoint, and then we'll have plenty of time for um, some questions afterwards. And here is, of course, uh, tonight's program, a little logo with a tip of the hat. Thank you to the Massachusetts Center for the Book. Here's the dust jacket of the book, and I like to start with this, and I have my little Massachusetts book on her uh, label on there, uh, affixed just recently. <clears throat> uh, that's the actual photo that we used, uh, Julia Margaret Cameron, taken in 1868. I love this picture because it really depicts Henry Wadsworth Longfellow at the height of his fame and his celebrity. It was taken in England during what, what was almost like a, a a, a victory lap for, for Henry Longfellow. He went on a, on a, uh, a European trip that started in, in Great Britain, and he was uh, received by Queen Victoria at Windsor Castle. He received honorary degrees from Oxford and Cambridge, and then they took a very casual trip uh, through a number of countries in Europe. But everywhere he went, he was, he was treated like royalty. He traveled with 11 members of his family. But what was interesting about this picture was taken on the Isle of Wight by uh, Julia Margaret Cameron, one of the great portrait photographers of the day. He was brought there by <clears throat> uh, Alfred Lord Tennyson, and he said, uh, Ms. Cameron, I'm leaving Mr. Longfellow with you. Take his picture. I'll be back. And uh, was quite splendid. And uh, earlier that day, actually, uh, not the same day. Yeah, it may, might have been the same day. I think he was, uh, actually, it was the same day when he went to see Dickens, but uh, Queen Victoria uh, welcomed him at Windsor Castle. And she wrote in her diary later that night how astounded she was to see 
the domestic staff taking vantage points, uh, very subtle, uh, almost hiding places to t get a look at this famous poet who had come to visit her in the castle. And she was just astounded that everyone, the common folks, I hate to use that phrase, but everyone not only knew who this man was, but he was a true celebrity. So that's very important. He's arguably the, the best known uh, American uh, in, in the world at the time. I'm, and I, I say this advisedly uh, more than any other public figure. And here he is at the height of his popularity again. You see him in the center. That's a reproduction of the bust that, uh, that uh, was made of him and uh, is, is erected in Westminster Abbey in Poets Condor, the only American to date, by the way, to have his, have his bust uh, uh, entered into a Westminster Abbey Poets Condor. The portrait at the right, uh, George Peter Alexander Healy, that's at Bowdoin College. And there he is with his uh, dog trap. So this is the Longfellow as everybody as everybody knows him. Now, uh, most everyone knows him. I point this out because the Longfellow I wanted to write about in Cross of Snow is not only the man, gentleman you just saw, but this gentleman you see right here. This is the Henry Wadsworth Longfellow as both his wives knew him. He was married twice. Both his wives uh, died under very tragic circumstances, which really influenced not only his life, but the poetry that he wrote. And here he is, you see him on, on oil, on canvas and oil, you see him in a silhouette, you see him uh, uh, by Winslow Homer in a sketch, uh, you see him in a photograph, you see him sculpted in stone on every imaginable surface. He has been preserved and already by the, these are in the 1840s, but this is the Longfellow as both of his wives do. I'm, I'm often asked, why, why a book about Longfellow? Number one, I was, I've been very, I was very dis, t t upset with the way he had been treated uh, in the 20th century by critics. Uh, really dismissed, I guess. The modernists were unhappy with his 19th century poetry. Uh, who knows what happened? There was this great movement, an iconoclastic movement, and Longfellow fell out of favor. That's all right. Poets, uh, poetry and writers, we come and go. So celebrity is a slippery slope. But in the very nasty way that he was treated, I thought that should be rectified and addressed. So there was that component. But even more so, I wanted to write uh, a love story. I've written, as Robert mentioned, eight books. And uh, uh, they're all works of nonfiction, cultural history. When do you get a chance to write a genuine, authentic love story? As, uh, as the title of the book, Cross of Snow, which we will get to, indicates. So this is the Longfellow, as both of his wives knew him. And this is the Longfellow, as he, uh, he was quite the clothes horse, by the way. And I, I, I write about that. You'll never see any photograph of him, any painting where he is not impeccably dressed. And here are a couple of photographs that he took. And... Uh, I just thought I'd put them in there. They're quite wonderful. Uh, uh, the, the students at Harvard kind of made fun of him, too. F playful fun. He knew about it, but they, they were always talking about his sartorial, his sartorial skills, and uh, he wore very flashy clothes, uh, uh, European finery, Savile Row suits, uh, European fashions. He was really very, very conscientious about his looks, and you see it in the pictures. Uh, let's just start a little bit of background here. He's a um, a, a child of New England, a very, a very opening words in my first chapter is he was, he was uh, in love with his New England uh, background, the fact that his great, his grandfather, General Peleg Wadsworth, uh, as you see the, uh, in that silhouette there of the, uh, at the left, who was a Revolutionary War hero. He uh, was uh, charged uh, with uh, defending the District of Maine during the Revolutionary War. He stayed there after the Revolution, and he became a very prominent man in Maine politics. And, uh, and this is the house on Congress Street uh, where Henry was brought up. Now, he wasn't born there, but he moved there as a very young man. That house was built by Peleg, and then his parents moved in. And uh, Henry's bedroom, I've been in there, is on the top floor on the left. It looked out at the, at the coast. Uh, the Longfellow is really quite unique uh, among American writers, I should point out, because he has not one, but two of his homes, which are uh, national historic uh, landmarks and are museums well worth your, your visiting. This one up in Maine, the uh, Wadsworth Longfellow House, and also, of course, the, the great uh, Longfellow House in Cambridge on Brattle Street, which uh, was so important and so influential in the writing of this book. Another reason why I was emboldened to do it, to do this book, is because of the wealth, the great wealth of material that is kept there by the National Park Service. And I'll be getting into that a little bit later. But his father, his grandfather was General Pilig Wadsworth. 
His father was Stephen Longfellow, who was a lawyer, a Portland lawyer, served a couple terms in Congress, and that's his mother. So he came from a very good family on his, on his, uh, with good, good uh, bloodlines. His father was a Harvard graduate. His grandfather on the other side was a Harvard graduate. Uh, Henry goes to Bowdoin College. We'll get to that in a bit. He was named for an uncle, Lieutenant Henry Wadsworth, who died in 1804 in the Battle of Tripoli. And a horrible, a horrible incident. And he was 22 years old. He was a young junior officer in the Navy. And uh, there was a, some sort of, I don't know what kind of a mission it was. Who knows? They all, it was a horrible explosion. It was sort of a torpedo attack on one of the pirate vessels. And it, uh, this is as it was depicted in a, in a contemporary uh, engraving, colored engraving of the time. But uh, uh, young Lieutenant Henry Wadsworth uh, uh, died uh, tragically and heroically. And that uh, and that action and the monument you see at the right is the very first uh, military memorial erected in the United States. It was erected in 18, oh, 1806, 1807, Carrera marble, actually brought to the United States on old iron sides, and it was in uh, Washington D.C. for many years. And during the Civil War, it was uh, moved to Annapolis, where it where it is today. So he was named for his uncle, uh, Henry Wadsworth. Thus, we have Henry Wadsworth Longfellow. Henry entered Bowdoin College in uh, Brunswick, Maine, not Harvard, like uh, both of his grandfathers and his father before him. It was a newly formed school, 1795, meant to be kind of a Harvard of the North. I went to Bates up in Maine, by the way, and Bowdoin is our very uh, big rival, very friendly rival. And here's a painting of uh, the way it looked in 1823 or so, when Henry arrived on campus as a 15-year-old sophomore. He had spent his freshman year at home being tutored, but he and his uh, an older brother, Stephen, uh, went to Bowdoin together uh, in the same class. And Henry arrived on the Bowdoin campus already a published poet. This is very important. Uh, he always wanted to be a writer. He, his father wanted him to be a lawyer. Uh, his father said, uh, we don't have independent wealth. You can't afford to live by your pen. And Henry uh, decided he, that's something he wanted to do anyway. But when he arrived at the, on the Bowdoin campus, he had already published poems, a number of poems in local, local newspapers, uh, pseudonymously or under his initials, but he'd, he already knew the taste of publication and he liked it. And while he was at Bowdoin, he excelled. He graduated fourth in his class. Among his classmates was, was his very good friend, Nathaniel Hawthorne. Uh, they consider the class of 1825 arguably one of the great college classes uh, in collegiate history. Who's going to argue with them? On his graduation day in 1825, graduation day, commencement day, I've seen it in the uh, minutes at Bowdoin College, he was offered the position. Uh, the trustees met and they voted to create a uh, professorship of modern languages. And only three other colleges in the United States taught them at that time, Harvard, William and Mary in the University of Virginia. Uh, James Bowden's wife left a stipend to create this, this professorship and they decided Henry Longfellow, who had proven himself quite brilliant at translation, they offered him the position. But first, he had to go to Europe at his own expense and learn the very languages he would be expected to teach. And his father, very sportingly, underwrote such a trip, and Henry left. And I, I write about this in my chapter I called Awakening. And this is where Henry really, I believe, the, the, the character of this man, the man he will become, is shaped in so many profound ways. He is arguably, I think, our very first multiculturalist. He embraced languages. He embraced not only languages, but he came to know Washington Irving when he was in Spain, uh, in Madrid. He became part of a little, the little circle there, and they embraced him. He was a very likable young man. And Irving told them, it's not enough to learn languages. You must learn and absorb uh, the literatures. And this he did. And he also, these are self-portraits, by the way. And all of these I photographed out of the journals of his, which are at the Houghton Library at Harvard. And he's quite, quite the talented artist, as you can see. And the picture on the far left, if you can see in the margin, he has Enrico. Well, that's, that's how the... Italians knew him, and uh, Enrique is uh, in Spain, and Henri in France, and there he is on the, in, uh, on, on the steed in Spain on the road to Malaga. He says, uh, and he quotes Byron, uh, uh, 
It was just a wonderful, wonderful sense of who he was and where he was traveling. And these journals are absolutely essential in learning him. He wrote home to his sisters and he said, I, he urged them, his sisters, to learn foreign languages. He says, for every language a person knows, another man he becomes, or another man or another woman. But he really urged his sisters to learn languages. He returned after three years uh, to Bowdoin College, uh, assumed his position. And uh, here is here, by the way, a couple of other uh, examples from his uh, travel journals. As you can see, he interleaves uh, illustrations in there in, uh, in Venice or in Spain. Uh, illustrations. Uh, these I photographed every page, by the way, of these hundreds of pages of journals at the Houghton Library, so you can see the strings up there. These are my photographs of some of these pages. But when he returned to Bowdoin, he uh, took up with a young woman from his hometown of Portland, uh, Mary uh, Stora Potter. They, became, they were married, and uh, by all accounts, they were very happy, and she was exceedingly happy on the Bowdoin campus where he became uh, this professor of modern languages. Um, he translated uh, um, from multiple uh, traditions. Uh, if there were no texts, he, he, he prepared his own books. He, in fact, in the uh, seven or so, six or so years that he's at Bowdoin, he publishes nine books, different translations, so he can teach them to his students. In one instance, he, he, he writes his publisher in Boston to send him sets of the page proofs from one of the the text so he can pass them out immediately to his students. He will be credited, by the way, with introducing so many uh, uh, authors to uh, American readers, uh, and among German authors, uh, Goethe and Schiller, he introduces those to American readers. He's, he's, he's one of the most important translators of Spanish and of Italian, as we'll see later when we get into the Dante translation. Uh, and he's also writing poetry, but he's also eager to, as he says, he loves it up in Maine, it's his, it's his home state, but as he writes to one of his friends, I'm not dead in Maine, but I'm kind of buried in Maine. And he was eager, after having traveled through all of Europe, to perform, as he said, on a larger stage. And then out of the blue, he has offered another position, the same, posi the same teaching position at Harvard College, to replace the great George Tickner, who handpicks Henry to replace him. And he's offered the same basic terms that, uh, from Harvard that uh, Bowdoin gave him, which is to, was to come and teach these uh, foreign languages and literatures. But first, he must go to Europe and learn another six languages. By the time he's done, he's, he, he has mastered a, at least a dozen languages. His library in uh, Craigie House, there are 12,000 books there in 45 different dialects and uh, uh, at least a dozen different languages, all of which we, we can assume he not only uh, or could read and translate, but uh, read fluently. He spoke fluently in so many different languages. People would say he's amazing. He speaks German with the German. He speaks French with French people, when uh, or Italian with the Italians. When the Emperor of Brazil, Dom Pedro II, visits him, they speak Portuguese. When Ole Bull, the, uh, the violinist, comes, he speaks speak Norwegian. Just an amazing individual and, and uh, very fluent in languages. And he, not only the languages, but the foreign cultures. He absorbs them. And that's why one of the reasons why he really tries to assimilate a lot of European traditions in his own poetry, uh, which he does, and for which he, a lot of people have criticized him, but that's a whole other story. So anyway, he goes to, um, he sets off to Europe with his first wife, and tragically she dies uh, five weeks or so after a miscarriage, and we really don't know much about uh, the weeks uh, leading up to it, they're very uh, discreet about what they write in their journals, but we really don't even know that she was pregnant until right about the time she has the child and she loses it. And Henry is uh, totally distraught. And, uh, and when he comes back to the United States, uh, meanwhile, he's, he soldiers on in, in, in Germany and he figures he's going to continue his work before returning home. And before he goes back, he decides he needs some he needs some rest, and he goes off on an overland tour. And in Switzerland, he meets the daughter of of, uh, of uh, Nathan Appleton of Lowell, Massachusetts, who were the founder of Lowell, Massachusetts, of Beacon Hill, who established Lowell, the textile uh, mills there. And he just falls head over heels with this young woman. Meanwhile, uh, they 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 spend a few weeks traveling together. The, Henry is invited to spend some time with them. He does. 
and he goes back and he takes up his position at Arvino. Here is here is Henry, his professor, contemporary paintings. The first one uh, depicts him in his uh, lo his robes at uh, at Bowdoin, and here he is by Eastman Johnson when he was teaching at Harvard. And here is young Miss Frances Elizabeth Appleton Longfellow. As we said, she is the daughter of a, a very prominent Beacon Hill uh, textile manufacturer, Nathan Appleton. And here she is painted at the, at the, by George uh, G.P.A. Healy in 1834. She's 17 years old. And there she is in, uh, in Florence, uh, sculpted by Lorenzo Bartolini. And there she is with her sister Mary on the right, is, is painted in Paris by Jean Baptiste Isabey. And that's this particular painting hung uh, for a while in the Louvre before it came back to the United States with the Appleton family. And not only was she beautiful and tall and rich, of course, which is another element, uh, but she was brilliant, truly a brilliant young woman who embraced knowledge in, in every imaginable way. Uh, that you could that you could speak of. She herself spoke a half a dozen languages. She spoke her mind. She had her own political, th her own thoughts on the issues of the day. And when Henry met her, he was totally dazzled. What he wanted more than anything else in the world was not only a woman that he could love and raise a family with, but a woman who he could who he could uh, uh, share intellectual. Uh, um, uh, conversations with and reading and and he, he had finally basically uh, met his equal uh, I, I have recently written an essay which I hope will be published in a uh, soon in a uh, uh, academic journal but I, I call it meeting of the minds the intellectual partnership of Henry Wadsworth Longfellow and uh, Fanny Appleton Longfellow it was an amazing it was an amazing uh, relationship when it finally developed because actually she liked him. She was 18 years old at the time, and uh, she had a, a life of her own to live. And uh, as much as he was interested in pursuing this young woman, she was interested in remaining his friend. Henry returned to Cambridge. He started calling on the home of uh, the Appletons on Beacon Street and Beacon Hill, and here are Nathan Appleton on the right, and Maria Teresa Gold Appleton, is painted by Gilbert Stuart around 1806, in 1806, and these paintings now also hang in Craigie House. And uh, Fanny, as I mentioned, was not only a, a, a brilliant woman who spoke many languages herself, she was a talented artist, and I'm showing you here some of her sketches that she made during this very trip that she met Henry. Here is a sketch of uh, the uh, Coliseum, another of the, I actually traveled to this, these particular uh, uh, landmarks on the right at Paestrum in, uh, in Italy, uh, outside of uh, Naples, where she traveled and she, I, I wanted to see that exact same scene that Fanny Appleton did, and uh, she did a remarkable job. Here she is, this is a, probably the only self-portrait we have of Fanny, actually, this is in Naples, and she's doing that Castel del Ovo, and there she is, young Miss Appleton, on the right with her sketch pad at the ready. A remarkable young woman. Uh, while they were together in Germany, by the way, uh, part of the courtship, and it's, this is recorded in Henry's journal and also Fanny's journal, uh, together they translated a ballad from German into English, and it's The Castle by the Sea by uh, Uland. And Henry later acknowledged that her, even though he is the man credited by multiple scholars, for introducing so many German authors to American readers, that her translation was superior of this particular poem, was superior to his own. And it was her translation that, that he used in the book Hyperion. And here is Fran Fanny's own handwritten version of that poem. She actually did two. There's one fair copy in the Houghton Library and there's another at the Longfellow House. But what I love about this, as you will notice, she, as she has basically written a little title page she has the title in German, and then she has uh, the uh, by the sea by the uh, uh, German uh, uh, Uland, but, but it's by Fanny E. Appleton and Henry W. Longfellow. She gives herself top billing. I think that's quite spectacular, and uh, she knew how good she was. This is a uh, Beacon Hill, and uh, this is a contemporary engraving. Appeared in Greece's Pictorial, 1843 just about the very same time that uh, Longfellow and Fanny Appleton, after seven years, they were married. But this is kind of where their, their house was at 39 Beacon Street. I can't really point out where their house is. I could point out the location, but I can't really identify the house itself. 
from this particular picture, but this is a, a contemporary view of, of what it looked like. Uh, Henry would go into Boston on a regular basis from Cambridge, four miles, he'd either walk it or, or take the carriage, and he would call on the Appletons. And here it is, the way it looked, same scene in 1890 or so. And Boston Common, this is, this was uh, Betts Beacon Street off on the left going up. There, there, there were magnificent uh, townhouse looked out on Boston Common. And this was one of the, another contemporary scene, actually, from 1843 or so. And that is the, the home of the Appletons. It's a very rare photograph. There's only one that I could find in the uh, historic New England collections that show the house with the three floors before a fourth was added. But that would be a, designed by Alexander Paris, by the way. And quite a beautiful home. It recently sold, by the way, for $16 million. So it, uh, it retained its value, I would say. Quite a magnificent place, and this is where when Henry went in to call on Fanny. It would be at 39 Beacon Street in Boston, and the, this is the interior as it looked uh, a little more than a, more than a hundred years ago, uh, while it was still on the ownership of the uh, Appleton family. It later became the Boston Women's Club, and I, uh, my wife and I, had a chance to visit it while it was be between owners, and uh, quite magnificent. That's called a bullfinch staircase, and the. And the in the center there, and it goes spiraling all the way up to it. It's absolutely quite magnificent. But this is kind of the Beacon Hill ambiance that Henry was was uh, striving for. And uh, as I said, she uh, they remained friends, but she rebuffed his his uh, his proposal, his admonitions, and he and he did what I regard as one of the one of the two dumbest things he ever did. The first one was to insist that his first wife, Mary, go to Europe with him because she really wasn't keen on doing that. She was a frail, rather frail young woman. And uh, sadly, she had that miscarriage. But secondly, writing a, a, a Romana Clay, a, a, a novel, a kind of a thinly disguised uh, a fictional treatment of his failed pursuit of Fanny Appleton. And Fanny, and she was Mary Ashburton in the in the book, and Henry was the Paul Fleming character. And here is how they were depicted by Burkett Foster in the first illustrated edition of Hyperion, 1853. The book itself was published in 1839. Well, that but that that's just made what might have been a three or four year courtship into a seven year courtship. Uh, she didn't even speak to him for a couple of years. How they had a rapprochement, well, I discussed that in the book, don't really have time to get into it here. But 1839 was a very interesting year. He, yes, he might have been eating his heart out about uh, not being able to uh, 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 win the hand of Fanny Appleton, but he was working. I mean, he wrote the Psalm of Life. You know, this very, this, and this is what everyone regards, all the scholars regard as what we say and call in mo modern publishing the breakout, the breakthrough work. Uh, it was published uh, uh, pseudonymously. But pretty soon everyone knew who did it. It was published all over the world. It was this, and, and I have this, have this uh, to give you a, an idea of just how popular it was throughout the world. Here it is painted in Mandarin Chinese on a fan uh, presented to him at the, at the, at, in the court of the emperor in China and given to Henry by the ambassador, the American ambassador, the envoy at a, at a dinner party, but it was brought uh, home and uh, the Psalm of Life appeared in multiple, multiple languages. And to this day, I mean, you have lines. You talk, we talk about words and expressions that, uh, that, have, that still endure in our common discourse. People don't even realize where they're coming from. But you, for just, just lines that come out of this poem, life is but an empty dream. Things are not what they seem. Uh, footprints on the sands of time learn to labor and to love. And it was, a, and this was 1830. So that was a smash. It hurt. Hyperion is 1839, and then he also writes uh, uh, the Village Blacksmith, and uh, which uh, is published the following year. But he wrote it in 1839. So he was working. He was the, he was a very uh, industrious Yankee, and he didn't. He, he believed in work and, and production, and this is the the actual tree uh, just before it was cut down uh, to widen the street in Cambridge. He went to live in uh, 105 Brattle Street, and this is Henry's own sketch of the of the chestnut tree with, under a spreading chestnut tree in his own hand, which was recently found, not recently, but in uh, uh, not so long ago among the collections at uh, Longfellow House, and uh, it's kind of wonderful. It's the actual tree with and, and with his own lines uh, from the poem in it. So this is 1839, but here's the here's the letter 18. 
43, May 10th, 1843. And that's, uh, I won't read the whole thing. You can see the, tra the, liter <laughs> the uh, transcript on the right. And uh, it's really probably the only love letter you will find exchanged between this, these two people. Uh, only about nine letters uh, are extant that they exchange. And you say, how could that possibly be? Well, first of all, uh, for the years of the courtship, they weren't really speaking what we call the courtship. That's with quotation marks around it. Uh, but they really weren't speaking. And then finally, when they were married, they were inseparable. And Henry once uh, wrote to a, an admirer in England who was wondering if uh, Henry might visit soon. And if he were to visit, would he be bringing his wife with him? And Henry said, it is a part of our theory of life to never be separated. I mean, they, but once they were married, it was instantaneous. And, it, and why do we spend so much time on this, if, especially with respect to the poetry? Not only is it a great love story, but their marriage ushers in, and it, this marriage embraces 18 years, 18 years of uninterrupted productivity and creativity. So many of his great works are published during this period, all of the long narrative poems, many, many of the shorter poems, Paul Revere's Ride, The Building of the Ship, Hiawatha, Miles Standish, uh, Evangeline, all are produced during this, 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 uh, this, the time of his marriage. And here, there she is, this one little love letter. And it was suppressed, by the way, I believe it appears in my book for the first time. Uh, I hate to say suppressed, but the Longfellow family and later generations uh, didn't want, the, I guess, Victorian tastes uh, expressing a little too much passion it was just not in the books, but it's a very important letter. So the wedding present that Fanny gave her husband, Henry, on her wedding day. This is, I regard this, by the way, as one of the great material objects. I haven't said much about materiality uh, in my presentation here tonight, but another reason why I really wanted to do this book and uh, was really encouraged to do it was not only because there's so much uh, uh, documentary material available. Did I mention 800,000, an estimated 800,000 artifactual and manuscript materials in Longfellow House, which is now owned and maintained by the National Park Service, but objects in situ. I mentioned that it is one of two museums devoted to Longfellow. What is truly remarkable about this, this one is everything in it is original to the owners. The furniture, the, the, uh, the uh, uh, various uh, uh, the furniture, and the, the, um, the paintings on the wall, even uh, these objects that are stored uh, in, in, the, in the basement vault. And this is a, a, an album, an album of, of pictures that Fanny sketched during that time in, in Europe when they met. What makes it really incredible to me uh, as a material artifact is not so much the pictures inside, which are wonderful, but look at the inscription and he, she has the date there, June 13th, 1843, the day of their wedding. Mary Ashburton to Paul Fleming. You remember the names of those characters I gave you a little while back in Hyperion? Mary Ashburton was the Fanny Appleton character, and Paul Fleming was the Henry Longfellow character. And what she is saying here, in essence, she's, she's, she's quoting from Psalms of Life, let the dead past bury, the, bury their dead, and now we begin a new life together as husband and wife. And to me, it's one of the most remarkable artifacts. And it's really, it's so often passed over. It's not even on public view. It's in the, it's down in the vault. And uh, it just says so much when an artifact tells you so much, you know, that even words themselves can't tell you, but it, it uh, so that's one wedding present. Here's another one. This is the wedding present from Nathan Appleton, uh, the father of the bride. And this is, uh, I call it a house for all seasons. And if you haven't, uh, you, so many of our 30 libraries on hand here tonight from uh, uh, Massachusetts, I believe they're open again after the pandemic. Uh, please go see it. It's just quite magnificent. It's right at 105 Brattle Street, just a half mile from Harvard Square. It's where this couple lived, for, where Henry lived for 50 years. And of course, he and his wife lived for 18 years. It was built in uh, 1759, so it is colonial. And uh, during the Revolutionary War, during the Siege of Boston, it was the command headquarters for George Washington. So it had a very, a very important historic significance and something that Henry and Fanny were ever mindful of. In fact, I think they were way ahead of their time on this because uh, they could have actually, if, if Nathan Appleton had had his druthers, he would have had his daughter 
move up on Beacon Hill and we've got a beautiful home up there. Uh, this was kind of, it might have only been 100 years old, but it was aging and it needed some work and it was old by, you know, contemporary standards. Uh, but th they have just felt the historic importance of this place and they were determined to retain its character. Uh, Fanny and Henry both said that we are going to retain uh, the, the integrity of this house and, 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 and true to, to Washington and the others that have lived. So I think they were way ahead of their time on that for historic preservation. And here's George Washington as he undoubtedly looked when he was uh, living there at uh, uh, the Vassal, was formerly known as the Vassal Manager, uh, Mansion, later known as Craigie House. And it looks a little different there because a, a, a later owner before the Longfellow was Andrew Craigie, for whom the house was known for many years, Craigie House. He added the two piazzas that we that, that distinguish the house now and a few other things in inside but that's the way the house would have lived uh, would have looked when uh, washington was there and this particular photograph uh, not a photograph this engraving is from an album that henry kept so i don't know where it originally was but it was cut and clipped in and, and in a uh, an album that he kept specifically uh, for craigie house that's the way it looked uh, well, during their lifetimes it was in uh, homes of american authors so you can see it was very uh, rural at the time there weren't that many houses they it was a working farm area and so she was a city girl, and here she was living across the river at this place in Cambridge, but they were very happy. And I'm, I swear I'm going to make a Christmas card with this, with this wonderful chromolithograph from 1904. I just love it. And this was, be, now this is long after, not long after, but yeah, 10 or 15 years after Henry's death. And it was still a magnet for, for the, for the uh, literary pilgrims who came streaming to visit this house even while henry was especially while henry was alive but long after his death as well uh, on their honeymoon uh, they went out for of all places to the uh, springfield arsenal and they went in and they saw these thousands of muskets rising to the ceiling and fanny was emboldened to suggest a poem to henry and she and she here she is writing to her mother-in-law he has written a poem lately upon peace which i am sure will give his mother's heart a throb of great joy and pride. but really she had suggested this metaphor of these weapons being the devil's organ and she wanted henry to use that as the central image in a poem which became the arsenal at springfield and a very very uh, uh significant poem that, which really uh, caused a lot of comment when it when it was when it was issued in 1844 uh, these are the only pictures that we have of Henry having me having made a sketch of Fanny She's dozing and Fanny making a sketch of Henry and they're both uh, 18 1847 and they're both in the study and the the number one activity of the day the number one big attraction of the day Every day without fail in the evening. They read aloud to she read aloud to Henry he, the first thing he noticed about her when he, he, he writes it in Hyperion and he said it in his letters was her voice, her musical voice. And she would read to him from uh, their vast library of books every night in multiple languages. And it was the highlight of the day. And uh, there you have it. Books are, as I said, are throughout the house, even repurposed windows. As you see here, the one on the left in the study downstairs. This is a, in a bedroom upstairs. Most of the books are still there. Uh, a number of the really important ones that have some annotations in it and associations, they went to the Houghton Library, about 1,500 of them, but still just under 12,000 books uh, uh, in, the, in the Craigie House. And just briefly going through the other parts of the house, all original uh, artifacts, paintings, furniture, this is the dining room. They were great uh, entertainers. Uh, they liked small dinner parties, about eight people. Charles Dickens had dinner there. You just so many people that had dinner there. Those are the Gilbert Stewart paintings over there on the right. Those are the paintings, of, uh, of the paintings of the three daughters. The famous painting of the uh, three daughters that he will write about in the Children's Hour, which we'll get to in just a little bit. Here's the library. Uh, what is known as the library, and you notice the busts of various of Greek tragedians on top of each one, kind of suggests the library of Robert Cotton, which is uh, in, in in England uh, back in the uh, Elizabethan times. Uh, uh, Robert Cotton, the famous collector, had had busts of Roman emperors on all of his on his book presses. Henry did that, and here's the study. This was George Washington's office during the siege of Boston, and it's really Henry did all of his work. 
and it re re it's really retained its character so much today uh, as it as it did then. All of these things are are authentic. The Eastman Johnson portraits of his friends are in, in there. We mentioned the children's hour. I hear in the chamber above me the patter of little feet, the patter of little feet, the sound of a door that is opened in voices soft and sweet. From my study I see in the lamplight descending the broad hall stair, grave Alice and laughing Allegra and Edith with golden hair. And this is these are the stairs they would come tumbling down in. Now you see that painting which you just saw in a previous picture, that's the painting on the left. What you see there on, a, on the right is a carte de visite, kind of small, and it was housed in a little tin frame about the size, and it was found lying uh, on the battlefield among the dead at Gettysburg. And no one knew whether it came from a Confederate soldier or a Union soldier, but some young man who just, uh, like so many other people, looked to Longfellow for inspiration and for comfort, had worn that into battle, had died on the battlefield. And that pendant was found, and it stayed among the collections of the Maine Historic Society. Very moving. How important, how influential was Longfellow? That's just one little example. This is the Martha Washington study. That's where she and Martha Washington entertained people. That's where Fanny liked to uh, sit and write. That was Fanny's desk over there in the corner that was brought with her from Beacon Street to the house. She did a lot of writing there. Upstairs, you find George Washington represented throughout the house. And here is a poem in Henry's hand, and that's uh, the close-up, and there it is over there on the right. Once uh, once within these walls, one who memory oft recalls, the father of his country dwelt, and that's from the poem, to a child. These are daguerreotypes taken to the family with their children. They had five children, six children, one of whom died in, in very young childhood, named for Fanny. Uh, here they are with their two sons. I love the one on the left, if you look closely enough. Uh, Char Charlie was a very irascible young man, and she's holding his head firm with that right hand just to keep him straight. And there she is, her favorite activity, reading to the boys. Uh, I, I, uh, these pictures appeared in my book for the first time. Uh, they were acquired by Bowdoin College in 2017, and they are, I believe, the last picture of Fanny taken and the last picture of Henry uh, taken with uh, without the beard uh, she dies in 1861 and this was these were taken just not so long before that uh, there are presentations from many of his famous poems in the poems in the house this uh, engraving of Evangeline is uh, in the bedroom upstairs uh, this uh, Hiawatha's departure by Bierstadt is actually uh, uh, is in the dining room on the back of that uh, back of that portrait and I, my friend Jerry Slater is watching out in Colorado on the back of this painting is the menu from a dinner uh, in London, and when in, in London when Henry was presented with this painting, and also the the menu from the dinner that they had that night. Henry pasted the menu to the back of the of the uh, picture. If you remind me, I'll send you a photograph of it, and I'll show you what they had for dinner that night. Well, we all know this poem, don't we? Uh, Paul Revere's ride. There's Henry on the stamp, and there's a, a, a illustration. Uh, issued dur during World War II. And what, I, what I really uh, impresses me most about this poem, when people say, well, it's about the Revolutionary War, and he gets things wrong, he didn't, he, he got things, he was writing a ballad, and he was talking about the here and now, and he was concerned about the impending Civil War. It was, this was in April of 1861, right after the, uh, not long before the war breaks out, and he writes, and if you look at the change of tenses, forborn in the night wind of the past, through all our history to the last, in the hour of darkness and peril and need, the people will, they will waken and listen to hear the hurrying hoofbeats of that steed and the midnight message of Paul Revere. Spectacular. Well, look at the date here, May 20th, 1861. Henry planted these lilac trees. They're still there. These are my pictures. The purple buds of the lilacs tip the hedges and the flowery tide of spring sweeps on. Then in the very next sentence he says the, the sounds of guns in the south are booming. I mean, we are, we are in this civil war. It is now underway. May 20th, 1861. Material object number two. Uh, when I was confronted with these, I just had to sit back and pause. And these are little snippets of golden hair. Remember uh, the daughter with the golden hair? This is Edith's golden hair. 
And the day Fanny met her demise, a horrible, a horrible uh, accident, she was snipping curls uh, from her daughter, Edith, and uh, sealing them in these envelopes. There are five or six envelopes, one of which is empty. We assume the last one is empty uh, because what happened, only the little girls, they were five and six, were witnesses, but a drop of uh, molten wax apparently dripped on Fanny's big dress, one of these big dresses that they wore, these um, horribly fire-prone uh, dresses, and her, her dress burst into flame. She ran just terrified and hysterical. Henry was dozing in the study. He tried to put out the flames of the throw rug, and uh, he did uh, way too late, and she di died the following morning. And whatever anguish and grief he felt after the death of his first wife has just com compounded many, many times over. Of course, he had five children. He was now a single father. And he wrote, he answered a, a letter to George William Curtis. He says, to the outside world, I am calm, but inwardly I am bleeding to death. And he really never forgot this, this, this woman. It really marked the rest of his life. And the reason he started to grow that beard, and he grew that beard as he was very severely injured in the fire. He had some facial scars in his hands. His hands were burned. So what did he do in the immediate aftermath? He said, I can't even write poetry right now. He turned to it, but he turned again to translation and to Dante. And this is arguably his very first copy of Dante given to him during that first trip long ago. And uh, to Europe by his good friend George Washington Green, and he turned to translating Dante into English, and he becomes the first American to do so. And here are my copies of the first edition of Dante's uh, Divine Comedy, open there to the to title page of Volume One. And it ended. Uh, Harold Bloom, the great critic, told me among others that he still regards this as one of the very best translations of Dante into English, because Henry believed firmly in authenticity. He said, "You don't want to tell the reader what you think." the writer is saying you should want to tell him what the writer is saying in words better expressed than I just did. But he's, he writes here to Ferdinand Freligrath, he says, I have taken refuge, re refuge in this translation of the Divine Comedy because of, because of, his, uh, of his loss. And if you go to Purgatorio, tell me Fanny is not on his mind when he does the translation thusly. Oh, how, ah, how much in my mind was I disturbed when I turned around to look on Beatrice that her I could not see, although I was close at her side and in the happy world. Fanny is with him there. There's no question about that. And he also started recycling some, up, not recycling, but repurposing some other poems that he's done in translations. And, uh, and he publishes the Wayside, Tales of Wayside in 1863. Uh, the Landlord's Tale becomes, Paul Revere's Ride becomes the Landlord's Tale. There's Ole Bull playing the, uh, violin, and uh, these were all based on real people, which is very unusual for Longfellow's poems. He didn't do that often, but in this poem, he, he, had, he had all of the, uh, the visitors to the wayside and kind of modeled on Can Canterbury Tales uh, on real people that he knew. And of course, here's the tale, here is the wayside inn, which became exceedingly f uh, well read all over the world, and here's a, here's a Courier and Ives lithograph that was basically done within a year of publication. They did seven of these. And when during the Civil War, his older son, Charlie, ran away and joined the Union Army, uh, Henry uh, couldn't dissuade him, and the young man was, was uh, wounded in battle, and he also got camp fever. And when he went down to visit Charlie once, uh, not to visit, to be with him during his convalescence, he was staying at a hotel in Washington, D.C., and visiting with his son, nursing his son during the day. And one Sunday morning, he writes this in a letter to his other son, he was startled to wake up and to hear the church bells ringing on a Sunday morning. And also across the Potomac, he, he could hear the cannonade of, of uh, artillery in the Civil War. And it inspired him a few months later to write Christmas bells. And he says, I heard the bells on Christmas Day. Their old familiar carols play. And wild and sweet, the words repeat of peace on earth, goodwill to men. And this is how they deck out the house every Christmas with those original those old fl uh, lanterns, it's quite beautiful. It's open to the public at Christmas, beautiful. Well, this I'm gonna move a little quickly now because I'm going a little long, but these are Eastman Johnson portraits of Henry's friends, all of which hang in the study. Quite beautiful, Con Cornelius Conway Felton, former president of Harvard, very close friend, Hawthorne, Emerson, Charles Sumner, 
and there's Henry Ann Sumner in D.C. That's that was when he was in Washington visiting, uh, nursing with Charlie. It was a very uh, Robert Frost who loved uh, Longfellow, and actually his very first collection of poetry uses a. I should go back there. I, I missed it, but uh, um, he was he went to visit the Senate chamber, and it was a, a senator noticed him in the gallery and asked to, asked to pause so the senators could go up and shake his hand. That's how popular he was. And how popular was his house as a, uh, as a, as a tourist attraction? This is the, uh, the uh, Sears and Roebuck model. It was called the Magnolia House, and it was, it was modeled on the Longfellow House, and you, there are a number of them still standing in the United States. And it was, uh, for, for a number of years, their best-selling uh, best model. And here's Longfellow in Greek. I thought I'd put it up there in a classic uh, comic book. We talk about Longfellow, the, the cultural hero, and, and just uh, pervading all, all aspects of American cultural life. I and mean, these are Longfellow cigars up on the right. And there's a Longfellow Wedgwood picture. And there's some um, pictures of, uh, of the Longfellow album that you could buy. It was just an amazing thing. And here's the paparazzi didn't, uh, wouldn't stop bothering me either. This is an 1878 picture. It's a stereoscopic view, and Henry says in his journal, there stood another photographer with his deadly instrument named as. And uh, it's one of the, it's the only picture I can think of that I've seen where he is actually seen outside of his house, and that's one of his daughters, Henry, in his study. I'm going to move a little quickly now. I want to, this is upstairs in the bedroom. Very important. You ask about the title, Cross of Snow. Do note the painting of Fanny on the <clears throat> wall. That's the bedroom. That's their. That's the bed where their children were born, where they spent lived their marriage, uh, their private room. It's where Fanny died. It's where he would die, and of course he had trouble sleeping. And there is the picture of his. There's the painting of his wife, and there is the bed. And he writes this poem again. Another item when I run across ran across this. This is the holographic copy of the Cross of Snow. And again, this if you, those of you who have worked in archives, you know it's, it's just chronological, one thing after the other, and this thing sort of pops up at you, and it's written on two sides. It's a, it's a standard, it's a standard uh, cl uh, classic sonnet of 14 lines, and he's done eight lines in the front, six in the back. The front contemplates that portrait on the left uh, of his wife, and the uh, six lines in the back contemplates this painting that, that has been seen by millions of people at the Centennial Exhibition. It's called the Mountain of the Holy Cross. And it's a mountain in Colorado that had recently been discovered and it had this image, not this image, but these fissures of snow that, which had the shape of a cross. And Henry writes in the long sleepless watches of the night, a gentle face looks at me from the wall. A, a gentle face I can't read it with the writing here, but I'm, I'm, I won't. I won't uh, brutalize the poem. I just invite you to to read it yourself when you have a chance. But he talks about this mountain in the distant west that sun defining in its deep ravines displays a cross of snow upon its side. Such is the cross I wear upon my breast these eighteen years through all the changing scenes and seasons, changeless since the day she died. And he wrote that on the eighteenth anniversary of her death, and they had been married for 18 years, and, uh, and it was this poem, which had been, was not published in his lifetime, but was found among his papers and published posthumously, and I thought that was the, the title for my book. And here's their, here's where they were all buried at Mount Auburn Cemetery, little Fanny, they had a little daughter who died, she was named for her mother, she's there, and both of his wives are buried there, and as his brother Sam said, there was a there was, uh, he had known both the suffering and the victory. He had uh, se se several flowers there to, to designate both grief and, and triumph. So finally, Catherine Lee Bates writes a uh, beautiful uh, tribute to him. O gentle minstrel, may thy rest be deep and tranquil as thy working tide was long. Our lonely hearts will grudge thee not thy sleep, who grudged us not thy song. So there we go, and that is my presentation. I hope we have time for some, for some uh, questions. Uh, let's see if I start with the sharing. There we are. I'm back again. Okay. So, all right, Nick. Wonderful presentation as expected. So, folks, if uh, we'll take uh, uh, you know roughly ten minutes of questions and comments. 
Uh, if you have any questions, please type them into the Q&A box. If you have any um, comments, uh, type them into the chat. And I will do my best to relay them all to uh, Nicholas. Let's see here. Uh, OK. Let me see here. So I apologize for any mispronunciations in advance. Uh, Chevy asks, the relationship between Hawthorne and Melville in the Berkshires is legendary. Uh, who was Longfellow's closest lifelong friend and muse? His closest lifelong friend, I would say, uh, was Charles Sumner. Not lifelong, but I mean, he met him when he, when he moved to Cambridge. But uh, from the time he moved to Cambridge in 1829, I guess it is, until Sumner dies, uh, they're inseparable. And, uh, and Sumner, uh, even to, to, while he's being the great abolitionist and he's having all these problems with being rejected up on Beacon Hill, he spends nights, several nights a week when he's not in Washington, he's with Longfellow. Longfellow lets him read everything he writes. And... Uh, Sumner is devoted to him and he's devoted to Sumner. So I would say number one, first among them all would be Charles Sumner. Uh, and follow up question, um, uh, who was the single greatest influence on Longfellow acknowledged by Longfellow himself? Uh, that's an interesting question. He pays tribute in a memorial, in a, a memorial address that he gave uh, I don't know if he gave it, but he wrote it, which is published by the Massachusetts Historical Society. When Washington Irving died, Washington Irving died, he credited Irving, number one, with giving him good advice, but also for having written the sketchbook of Jeffrey Crayon, which Henry used as a model for his first book, which he, uh, Ultramare, uh, uh, Travels Beyond the Sea, and it was kind of a, it was a sh rather shamelessly modeled on, on Washington Irving. And he did say that Irving was the first great, great influence. But, you know, when he was doing all of the, all of the, all of his studies and his research, and he was a voracious re reader, and he really was a polymath, he was so influenced by all of these literary traditions and all these other works of literature. So it's not necessarily just an individual, but I think just the literatures, literatures of the world were so influential on him. But he, he credits Washington Irving creatively, and he's devoted to his father, of course, as an influence. But uh, he's also he also keeps a lot of his thoughts pretty close to his vest. It's very he wrote these wonderful diaries and letters, but he really so often does not let you get really inside him. And that's uh, one of the big raps against his uh, his diaries. I think the diaries are wonderful, but I, I do agree they could probably be more forthcoming and revealing more of, uh, of who, he, who he owed things to, so to speak. Uh, so Jerry says, great presentation. Donnie says, thank you very much. Wonderful presentation. Lori says it was beautiful. Marilyn mm -hmm. says, thank you. I enjoyed it very much. Uh, Beverly asks, uh, did Wadsworth, uh, I'm sorry, did Longfellow have any connection to Thoreau? Uh, they visited, uh, but not, not, not close. He was cl close to, to, to Hawthorne. And he, he and Emerson were friendly, very good. I wouldn't say they were, they were especially close, but uh, you see mention of Thoreau coming over for dinner. In fact, he's, uh, there's a big falling out with between Charles Sumner and Henry's father-in-law, Nathan Appleton. Nathan Appleton is what you call a cotton wig. Uh, he, he certainly is not pro-slavery, but he's, he's not in any rush to, uh, you know, to, and to lose out all of the cotton shipments up for his textile mills. And that was what we why we call them the cotton wigs. And Sumner, on the other hand, is this just uh, uh, uncompromising abolitionist. And poor Henry's in the middle and his wife's in the middle. So there was a big falling out between the Sumner was no longer welcome at the Appleton home. And, and they had been friendly up prior to that. They actually, uh, Sumner is a distant cousin of his second wife, uh, Nathan Appleton. But in one letter, he, he Appleton is coming over for dinner one night at uh, in uh, at uh, Brattle Street, and he writes a letter to Sumner. He said, uh, "I I don't think I don't think you should come to dinner tomorrow night for reasons that you can appreciate. Why don't you come Thursday night? Thoreau will be here." So he he's kind of said he sweetens it by saying, "Well, don't come tomorrow, but when you come uh, the night after, I got uh, Hawthorne and Thoreau." And I think Emerson, I was, I mean, you talk about a, uh, a murderer's row of, uh, you know, a lineup of all-stars having dinner that night at the, uh, you'd love to be a fly on the wall for that dinner. 
but uh, yeah, they they had they they had they were. Um, I wouldn't, wouldn't even go so far as to say they were friendly, but they were certainly uh, familiar with each other. Uh, Terry asks, when did Longfellow's reputation fade? What exactly was the critique? Oh, I think you can see it coming in the early years of the 20th century. I mean, it didn't, this, this is the point, by the way, it didn't just fade. There was a, I mean, I, I point this out in my opening and in my introduction. I mean, he he was the target. You had the modernists and the new critics, they, and they. I mean, there, there's no there's no secret about it. They targeted him. I mean, he was he was reviled. He was literally kicked out of the literary canon. They stopped publishing him in textbooks. You didn't read him in colleges. He's starting to come back a little. He'll never he'll never regain his former stature. But there was a concerted effort to to uh, diminish him as as a poet. And I'm not saying he's the greatest 19th century poet. Uh, but there's nothing wrong with being in the top five or ten. I mean, you know, okay, Emily Dickinson, uh, 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 Walt Whitman, they are the great stars from the 19th century who really resonate uh, in our time. But don't dismiss Longfellow. I mean, uh, I know, th I quote a letter from Theodore Roosevelt. As this was going on, he writes a letter to a, a critic at the Atlantic, and he said, please, please, don't be so hasty. Don't dismiss Longfellow. Uh, uh, so summarily, Daniel Aaron, the late Daniel Aaron, who was the founding president of uh, the Library of America and taught for many, many years at Harvard. He died at the age of 103 a few years ago. He said, American literature is not so rich that we can afford to, to dismiss some pretty, some, a good writer like Henry, Henry Wadsworth Longfellow. There's, there's a lot of stuff that he wrote that's dated and, and maybe is not... Uh, doesn't really speak for today, but there are so many wonderful things that he wrote that just, that, that just, I think, I think nobody wrote a better, no American wrote a better sonnet than Longfellow. He wrote about 45 sonnets out of the hundreds of poem, poems that he wrote. He really, towards the end of his life, he really turned to the sonnet. Cross of Snow is one of the sonnets, but uh, for his Dante translation, he wrote six sonnets, two to in introduce each of the, uh, of the parts of the Divine Comedy. They're, they're magnificent. And uh, you, you, you would do well to look at some of his sonnets and read some of them. Well, they're beautiful. So uh, it, it, was, it was really a, an unfortunate situation. And I don't think it was a natural thing because he has always remained popular and well, uh, and decently not popular among a certain class of people. Uh, not a class, but a readership, an old, perhaps an older readership for sure. And so many of us had to memorize his poems in school. I can't tell you the number of people who have written me and said, oh, I'm... I love this. I love uh, I love the Psalm of Life. I Paul Revere's Ride, the building of the ship. They could, they all have a favorite poem. And when the Library of America, by the way, was the hundred and second book in their series of the American Canon, so even they waited a hundred books before they brought out Longfellow. It's now one of the top ten selling books in their series. I, I, I don't don't hold me to the top ten, okay? I, I saw a statistic, but it sells very well. It sells quite quite decently considering. Uh, they've got several hundred different authors in their in their back uh, their back list now. Longfellow continues to do decently. Uh, he All has right, so Nick, has... Nick, I have eight questions left. I'm only going to get to four of them, uh, and then you and I and the rest of the audience can watch the Olympics. Okay. Okay. So sure. I'm going to ask Jackie's question first. Uh, did Longfellow have faith in God or Christianity? So can you tell us a little bit about Longfellow's religion? Uh, Longfellow was a Unitarian. His wife was a Unitarian. Um, you don't find uh, he lost both of his wives and the second wife in such a horrific fashion. And yet you don't find him railing. You don't find him railing, God, why me? Why this? You don't find any of that at all. You find a very steadfast man. You don't see him writing uh, about his faith to uh, uh, very often, but but it was strong and it was firm. And his wife uh, uh, had spiritual advisors. Uh, they were there. again, they were very strong Unitarians, Unitarian belief. Uh, but I, I don't think that you will find anything more overt than than that. Jerry asks, Do you think Longfellow could have used his bully pulpit to speak out more on slavery, especially since Sumner was such a great abolitionist? Yes, he could have, but but I, I I I respect what he did. You know, he did write, by the way, poems on slavery, and they were published in 1842, a full ten years before Uncle Tom's Cabin. 
Even Hawthorne was aghast that he would write about, uh, uh, he would write about, take up the issue of slavery. Everybody had been after him. His, and, but then Sumner himself said in a letter to Francis Lieber, he said, do not expect war odes from Longfellow. He's not John Greenleaf Whittier. Whittier was clearly, we all know where he stood. He wrote poetry, and, uh, but Longfellow was, uh, was, again, more of a poet of the people. And when he writes, for instance, about, I quoted uh, Paul Revere's ride, he's writing there about the, the breakup of the impending uh, dissolution of the Union and the Civil War, but he's using the Revolutionary War as, as, the, th as the theme, you know, and he he's does this uh, a number of times in different po poems. He will, he will be writing about issues, he'll be writing about uh, 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 various social issues that, that uh, that he's interested in, but he won't, he will not do it overtly. And I, I agree, he probably could have, but I don't think that would have been the Longfellow that we know. And I do say, take a look at those seven poems on slavery that he did write. I think that they're very, they're very eloquent, and I think they speak to the horrors of slavery. And they were, and they, they were, they were controversial enough that a publisher in Philadelphia refused to include them in a, in a collection of, of his poetry. All right, one of you wants me to recite three lines of poetry, okay, and then ask you a question. So okay. uh, in Cross of Snow, Longfellow writes, a uh, quote, there is a mountain in the distant west that sundifying in its deep ravines displays a cross of snow upon its side. And the viewer wants to know, is Longfellow referring to a specific mountain? Yes, uh, and I, I'm sorry, I didn't, I wasn't more precise about that in my remark. He's referring to a mountain Called it was has a name the mountain of the holy cross and it was had been had been he he say discovered but it was yeah it was discovered by by certainly uh, uh, Eastern Americans I mean the Native Americans certainly knew it but it was out in the Colorado Ro Rockies and uh, uh, some daguerreotypes had been made of it and uh, uh, Thomas Moran went out and painted it and the painting of the cross of the holy mountain uh, won the gold medal at the philadelphia exposition where longfellow saw it and he also saw it during a tour and thomas moran wrote him and mentioned the poem so we know that longfellow knew that mountain and that quite specifically is the mountain that he's referencing which is pictured if you go we call that that last image that i showed you i showed the point painting of fanny on the wall and the other painting of that mountain with the with the cross oh, that was an actual mountain yes uh, I'm going to read a few more comments, but let me ask you one last question. Uh, Michael asks, thank you for this wonderful book. Do we have a sense of Longfellow's relationship with his son in later life? Um, I, I discuss his, uh, his relationships with his children in the book. Charlie was an amazing kid, and he was... Uh, um, he traveled the world. He was kind of a free spirit. He died young. I'm smiling. He was. He did things. Everything is. Again, he he ran off and joined the joined the Union Army at the age of 17, and he 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 went in a way that his father wouldn't even know which way he went. He had a letter posted from Maine when, in fact, he was taking the, the train down to Virginia. It was only because of his surname that a, that a, a an officer of the Union Massachusetts uh, Cavalry recognized him and uh, contacted him and said, I got this long fellow here and he's your son. What should we do with him? And, uh, and Henry could have had him sent home because he was underage, but he said, that's what the boy wants to do. Uh, he loved his children, uh, but his, and uh, he was concerned with Charlie because Charlie inherited a lot of money from his mother. His mother was very wealthy. And uh, at one point, he, Char Charlie's living in Japan and he's traveling all over the world. He goes to Egypt, he goes to Nepal. And he's basically, Henry writes him, you basically burn through half of your inheritance. He's concerned about that. So, but he loved, he loved Charlie. That dog that you saw in that picture with uh, Trap, that was Charlie's dog that, uh, that, Henry, that Henry basically acquired and made it, made his own, because Charlie was all, always traveling. The great story about that little dog, uh, Henry's brother-in-law, uh, Tom Appleton, uh, built a yacht called the Alice, named for one of their, their, their oldest daughter. And it set a record for an Atlantic crossing for its size. And Charlie was a hand on it. He, he went, uh, Tom Appleton actually had that yacht built to, to suit Charlie. Tom didn't, Tom didn't sail. But the point is, when that boat left on that, on that sailing, Tarp, the little dog, uh, stowed away. And they found it halfway across, and they turned it over to another ship coming in and said, please bring it to Brattle Street, which he did, and they'll give you $5. 
But he had a nice relationship with his sons. But uh, I think he handled it in the right way with his boys. Excellent. Uh, let me uh, read a few comments uh, to you. We'll uh, see here. Uh, Elaine says, a book that needed writing. Thank you for your tireless research and bringing this man to a modern audience. Debbie says, thank you uh, so much for this book. I have always loved Longfellow. Angela says, thank you very much for your writing and this presentation. I look forward to visiting the Longfellow House in Cambridge. Maureen said, I thoroughly enjoyed this program. Thank you. Uh, Lucy says, thank you. Fantastic presentation. <laughs> nice. And Melissa says, thank you for this presentation and your work. I've been to his home in Portland and hope to get to the one in Cambridge. So, uh, Nicholas, do you have any uh, last uh, words for the group uh, before we wrap up for the evening? Just just to thank them all really profoundly for coming out tonight and uh, in such numbers and to spending the evening with me and with you and with all our fellow bibliophiles and talking about someone we uh, all clearly appreciate and love, which is Longfellow. And thank you. Thank you for the, all of you for the wonderful, uh, really nice, nice words about my book and my work. Great. Well, thank you all so much. Uh, look for an email for me tomorrow with a recording and the feedback survey and uh, information about some of the other upcoming author visits we have with the uh, Massachusetts Book Award uh, winners and honorees. Uh, so again, thank you all so much, and I hope everyone enjoys the rest of their night. Thanks so much, Nicholas. Thank you, sir. Robert, yep. I hope to see Bye -bye. you again soon. Thank you so Absolutely. much. Absolutely. Don't be a stranger. Bye-bye.